how hard we can. We're good? Sweet. All right. So, uh, welcome back, guys. Today we're going to start on some methods for solving ordinary differential equations. Next week we'll be solving partial differential equations, and then CS205 is over. Congratulations, you're almost there. And to that end, a couple things. You have a homework due today, and then uh, I posted another homework this morning. Your TAs think it's easy, so that's, that's good. We'll see if that's true. And uh, <clears throat> it's due the Monday after Thanksgiving break, so you have two weeks for this one. Um, you'll notice I made this the last homework because the week after that is finals week, although the final for TS205 I think is pretty late in the schedule. Uh, I probably will post one last optional homework. Maybe we'll do one of these deals where if you do it, you can replace your lowest homework grade or something. Uh, because there's about two weeks of material that this homework doesn't cover. And, and well, you guys are responsible for it on your final. I, I contact you responsible for it on your final. Uh, it's, it, you know, you might want some practice with it regardless. So I'll, I'll try and post uh, at least some sample problems or maybe a problem set so that those people that, that want to, you know, get rid of one of their low homework grades can do that. Uh, cool, you have a homework due tonight. Hopefully, how many of us have started? Okay, good. Yeah, uh, there's, there's nothing too bad, but, but at least there's a, there's a linear system in there that, that I'm noticing everybody's kidding slightly differently, so make sure that you at least do part 1A pretty quickly. And then if you have questions, post them on Piazza, and you're going to have to rely on your other students to help you if you plan on submitting by midnight, because I'm pretty much gone after class until very late tonight. Uh, cool. And then your next homework is out. There's a very small coding part on that homework as well, but you can use whatever language you like. It's like two lines in MATLAB. It's mostly just as an experiment rather than uh, as anything non-trivial coding-wise. Any questions about uh, your homework, your final exam, other stuff in this class? Know that I think all opportunities to drop or change your grading basis for this class have officially passed as of last Friday. So you are all well entrenched as you should be at this point. Um, yeah. Anything? Go once, go twice? Yeah. Cool. All right. So, right, so unlike the first sort of two-thirds of CS205, right, so the, so the first two-thirds of CS205 were all about analyzing functions, right? We already had this motivation a little bit last time, <coughs> where, where the idea was, if I give you a function f of, f, f of x, can I find its roots, can I find its minima, and so on, right? But there are lots of problems that have as their unknown a function. Right? And we saw these last week, for example, when we talked about um, interpolation or differentiation or, or integration, you can think of these all as, for example, I have samples of a function f of x, but I don't know f of x everywhere else, and I'm trying to find f of x to fill in values in between. You see how this is fundamentally somewhat of a different problem than, than what we've had before, where you have, like, find one point minimizing that. Now the actual thing you're trying to find is a function. Right? And you'll see, actually, the first problem of, of this coming problem set, which, which as a differential geometry guy, I'm, I'm morally obligated to give you, uh, it shows you how you can extend some of these theories of least squares and so on to the case where you're trying to find a function rather than just a point. And there's, so there's a whole theory uh, involving, involving weak PEs and so on that, unfortunately, we will not touch in this class, uh, that, that, that forms the basis for some really interesting methods for solving PDEs discreetly, by the way. Um, and, and, and kind of connects these two things. But anyway, from our standpoint, the main thing we need to know is that the theme of the last three weeks, starting last week, including this week, and then next week when we consider partial differential equations, is that we're trying to find a function rather than just one value. Cool? Hopefully, uh, you know, the, the kind of, the, the, the mindset here is clear. Now, last week, we sort of had a simple version of this problem. Right? Where we, we basically said, I know some values of f at some isolated set of points, and I'm trying to fill in the values everywhere else, or compute is integral, or is derivative, or what have you. Right? So in this case, we know sort of direct information about our function f. Right? We can evaluate it at different points, and now we're just trying to fill in some missing information. But today, we're going to have a new twist, and rather than simply kind of filling in missing information, we're going to say, what if we write down some properties that we'd like f to have? Yeah. And if we can write down these properties, now we want to optimize an f uh, to satisfy this. Right? This is sort of similar to the problems that we've already designed. Right? When we did least squares, we said we wanted to find a point that satisfies ax equals b as well as we can. Right? That was a property of x that we liked, and then we satisfied it in some nice uh, sort of energy way. And now we're going to do the, basically the same thing with the function. Yeah? So it's kind of reasonable enough. And to me, this is more or less 
uh, what the theory of, of, of differential equations is all about. Now, if you're a simulation guy, this is quite different, and we will talk about these two kind of parallel mindsets at the same time. So anyway, there are lots of example problems we can think of. For example, the first problem on, on this coming homework that, that's posted on the web page uh, is, basically says, let's say that I have some function f0, and he's kind of noisy, and I'd, like, and, and I'd like to approximate him with some other function f. Can I write down an f that's a good approximation of f0, but somehow smoother? Right, so we're going to write down an energy function that measures the smoothness of f, and then we're going to trade off between how smooth f is and how well f approximates f0. Yeah? So the story from a high level seems very similar to some of these least squares problems we've already written down. Yeah? Uh, similarly, uh, probably the one that is most familiar to you guys from high school physics is that you'd like to find a way to simulate a system of particles moving around obeying some physical law. Yeah, the most famous, famous physical law that we all should probably know in this class. I suppose technically it's not background in this course, but, but uh, chances are you've heard of it, which is Newton's second law, and it says that force equals mass times acceleration. Yeah? That's nothing more than a differential equation, right? The acceleration of your particle is the second derivative of his position, and the force is some function of his position and, and his velocity. Right? So for example, if you have a bunch of springs, then this is a, a function of where you are, right? it's how tight the spring is. Or if you have wind, uh, wind resistance, right? the wind is, is holding you back based on how fast you're moving, at least in some models for wind, I'm told. This is not my thing. Anyway, uh, right, so, so, so in this case, what, is, what do we know about the system? Well, we know f equals ma. This is a property of f. But we don't know f itself, and our job is to fill it in. Yeah? Or a third problem might be sort of similar to the first, where right? approximate f0 with f, but transfer properties of g. This turns out to be a very important problem in computer graphics. For example, if you Google, there's a whole series of papers on this idea of flash, no flash photography. Has anybody taken like one of Mark LeVoy's classes and seen this before? Yeah, it's really clever. So, so, so the idea is, if I, have a, if I have a camera, and I take a photo in really low light, right, and, and, and I have a very short exposure time, then there are, like, aren't that many photons to go around. Yeah? And so if I take this very quick photograph, then I don't expect that many photons to come into my camera and I get a very noisy image. Right? So what's one way to fix that? Well, I could put a humongous light bulb on the top of my camera and flash the light when I take a photo, and now I have a flash photograph, and there's lots of photons to go around, but I didn't get the nice, you know, romantic candlelit dinner look that I was looking for in my photograph. Yeah? So there's a whole literature on these papers where you say, well, one trick might be to put down a camera and take two photos. One that's noisy, but has a sort of nice, you know, romantic ambiance that I like, and the other that, that's very low noise, but, but, but a little bit clinical by taking, by taking the photo with a flash. Right? So in that case, you have sort of an instance of this third problem, and in fact, there's some PDE models for solving this that basically say, I'd like uh, F to look like F0, right? But F0, this photo I took in low light is very noisy. So I'd like it to somehow have, you know, nice sharp edges that come from the flash photograph. Yeah? So that would be an example of a problem in So anyway, all this is to say that there's a large class of problems for which you're unknown as a function, and all you can do is write down properties of that function rather than just sampling it at a few points. Yeah? And, and so, in, in your, again, in your first homework problem, you work out sort of the basics of the theory for, for, for how to do this in general. So, right, so we're going to, we're, next week we'll consider some of the, the sort of image processing looking problems, but for this week we're going to look at problems that are closer to physics. Okay? So in particular, we're going to consider something called an initial value problem. Yeah? By the way, how many people have, have solved some sort of initial value ODE in some class? Math 53, for example, CME 10, whatever the heck. Uh, I think even AP Calculus covers very small numbers of ODEs, right? Where you have this, what do they call it, separation of variables? In fact, maybe we'll do that later in class. Anyway, yeah, so, so an initial value problem, we're going to only have derivatives in one variable. Yeah? So our unknown function for today is going to be f of t, and we can think of t as time. By the way, I noticed, uh, because I wrote my course notes at 4 in the morning, that occasionally I made the uh, identification y equals f of t, but I'm not sure I ever said it in your notes. So anyway, if I start talking about y, uh, these are the same thing. Cool. So y is a function of time. And, and what is the property that, that we're trying to optimize? Well, we're going to have some big, some function big F, right, who basically just writes down one relationship between time, F of t, F prime of t, and so on. Right, we'll see a bunch of examples of this in just a moment. 
Right? And, and all we're given is this relationship as well as the position, velocity, acceleration, what have you, of your particle at time zero. Yeah. So you can see how this is very, like, if, you, if you're trying to keep a concrete example in your head, the easiest one is simulation. Right? So in simulation, what is, uh, what is the ODE we're solving? It's F equals MA. Yeah? And the initial data is the position and velocity as well your particles at time zero. Cool? All right. Right, and there you have it. There's uh, our most famous example of an ordinary differential equation. Total force is equal to mass times acceleration. Okay. And uh, in particular, if you want to simulate, for example, uh, 25 particles all connected by springs, we actually talked about this a little bit uh, in like week four or five of this class. But you can think of having n particles as really having three n unknowns, right? Like the, the positions, x, y, z, of all n things simultaneously. Right? So, so oftentimes, we'll, we'll, we'll think of writing down uh, the ODE, right? The, by the way, ODE, ordinary differential equation, that's what that means. Uh, we can think of our unknown, this y of t, as a point in, for example, for simulation, r3n, right? Where this is simultaneously encoding the position of all of our unknowns all at the same time, right? If you don't like that, you can think of having n different unknowns all in r3, it's all the same, but the notation is a little more cumbersome. Right, so there are any number of examples uh, where you'd like to solve it with the ease. I, I picked out one or two, but they're a little corny because it's just so easy to find examples of people that use ODEs, right? So, so, so one slightly uh, less obvious application of more or less F equals MA, once again, is this idea of protein folding, right? So one thing that apparent, apparently we can do is we have the machinery for figuring out the sequence of molecules that are all kind of attached to one another in a protein. But that doesn't tell you the geometric structure that you're likely to see in the protein, right? So I have this big, long chain of carbons and hydrogens and nitrogens and God knows what, and, and each of these, these, these molecules are attracted to each other by, by different forces, right? So for example, there's this, what, the 612 potential, or 48 potential, 79, I don't know. There, there are all these different potential functions that basically pull molecules toward each other in different ways. So you think of these as little strings tying all the molecules, right? And what happens over time is your protein really wants to go to one of these very low energy configurations, right? By kind of folding and bending and coming to these conformations. And then that geometric configuration of all these molecules determines the function of your protein in, in a large way. This simulation problem is really, really, really hard. And the reason is that a lot of times the, the, the intramolecular forces in these proteins cover all kinds of different time scales, right? So it might be that there are very strong forces between uh, molecules that are very close to each other, where the second you try and tear them apart, they yank back together, right? In which case you need a very time, small time step to, to resolve those dynamics, whereas maybe there's also some weak force that, that's pulling you know, molecules from very far apart in the chain together slowly, right? So, so then you, you need a larger time step to resolve that kind of motion. Right? But this is like hell on wheels to simulate, right? Because you're limited by the strongest, most annoying force in your simulation, right? And so, so oftentimes, when you see these, these diagrams of protein folding papers where they have like, they show time on an exponential scale, which is kind of funny to think about. And they need different ways of resolving forces on all these different scales. This is very challenging. Now, for something completely different, if we go back to the problems that we were talking about a couple weeks ago, right, where we're trying to minimize a function, Right? The easiest way to minimize a function, although not necessarily the fastest, as you probably discovered on your homework this week, is gradient descent. Right? And what happens here is, let's say I have a function e of x. E usually stands for energy. I guess before we talk about f, but whatever. And I'd like to find the point x that minimizes e. Yeah? And if you recall, the line search strategy for, for, for minimizing a function is simply you take the minus gradient direction, you point your toes in that direction, and you move along that line to minimize your function, and you just iterate. Yeah. Hopefully the story is familiar. If not, you should, uh, you should come talk to me after class. Anyway, um, in fact, you can actually write down an ordinary differential equation that does gradient descent on a very small scale. So let's say that I'm standing at a point x. One thing I can say is that my velocity, right, dx dt, is the minus gradient. Right? So this is telling me that I'm going to infinitesimally move a tiny little bit in the grad e direction, and then I'm going to update my gradient step again. Right? This is an ordinary differential equation. And solving it is actually a perfectly legitimate strategy for minimizing e. This is very different, actually, from, from the methods that we talked about in class, 
Because remember in class we talked about this line search step, which moves like a big, it wants to minimize E as much as it can along a line before, before updating the gradient. Here we're saying do the opposite of that, right? Just move an itty bitty step along the gradient and then update. You know? There's a whole class of methods that deal with this. And actually, in the, in the theory of PDEs, this is very important. So for example, uh, the durational energy that you write down, wrote down in uh, your homework that's due today, um, if you write down this uh, differential equation, what you get out is heat flow along the graph. So it turns out all these theories talk to each other. Uh, in computer graphics, a very important example of uh, ordinary and partial differential equations is the idea of crowd simulation. So let's say that I, I, I'm making World War Z and I have a crowd of 10,000 zombies and they're all running around, what, Israel? I forget what happens in that movie. But uh, I mean, all my zombies are running around. Obviously my zombies follow pretty simple rules, like they see other zombies and they run toward each other, or they see human blood and they run even faster. And, and, and you can think of these actually as differential equations. And in fact, state-of-the-art in crowd simulation does exactly this, right? Where basically each of your zombies has this little set of rules that's determining, uh, you can think of them as little forces on his motion, right? Which are, are, are sort of determining what he's thinking about at the back of his, his zombie mind. And then we, we're integrating this forward in time. And of course, we have to be very careful choosing, choosing our integration strategy because you have, like, potentially bajillions of zombies all interacting in funny ways, right? So if you take, for example, too large of a time step, they could, like, interpenetrate or something really bizarre, which obviously, at least in World War Z world, doesn't, doesn't happen. Um, right, in fact, uh, at the very large scale, the, uh, a really interesting ha thing happens where people have, have developed analogies between crowd movement and fluid flow. And so a lot of the algorithms for simulating fluids actually are also used for infecting around densities of humans or zombies in a scene uh, to get some kind of realistic motion where there's this sort of higher level crowd intelligence of like people trying to escape from a room, for example. Yeah? Obviously we're not going to write down those ODEs, but I can point you to some, some, some very interesting papers that do this. So there's all kinds of examples of differential equations. By the way, today's lecture will be a little, we're going to spend a lot of time on the theory of ODEs because I feel like that's not part of the background that's necessarily required for this class, so hopefully this is important for you. But there, there are all kinds of examples of, 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 of different sort of shapes and sizes for differential equations that you can find in real life. Yeah. So, so probably the simplest one is, is, is what, I, what I showed at the top bullet point here. Right, where we're going to say y prime equals, for example, 1 plus cosine of t. Right? And for, for all the things on this slide, we're going to say y is a single variable and he's a function of time t. Yeah? So hopefully we all know how to solve this equation. Right? dy dt equals something in t. Just integrate both sides with respect to t. Yeah? And in fact, if you want to solve this differential equation, the, the best, your best bet for solving it would be to just use the quadrature methods we talked about last week. Right? Sort of a next level of compl com complication here might be that the first derivative of y, for example, is a function of y itself. In fact, this one that I draw here is very important. And if we kind of go up more and more to levels of complication here, for example, maybe we have you know, dependence not only on your position y, but also on time simultaneously. You can see here y prime is ay and e to the t. By the way, if you take math 53, you'll spend like your whole life solving e to ODEs basically of this form because it turns out that most differential equations that aren't of this form just don't have a close form solution. Um, maybe you would involve multiple derivatives. For example, here we have a relationship between the second, first, and zeroth derivatives of y all kind of tied together. Yeah. Or maybe you just have the, the differential equation from hell, and you can see here that, that, for example, the derivative of y is stuck in an exponential here. So all of our nice linear techniques totally break down in this case. All of these show up in practice. If you're bored, go on Wikipedia sometime and they have a page of like common ODEs and it's like four bajillion lines long and, and has everything from fluid flow to, to, to groundwater and, and geophysics to crowd simulation to uh, I don't even know what stock market stuff, right? There's this idea of a uh, stochastic differential equation where you don't know everything and they kind of wiggle around in time. These theories get arbitrarily complicated. And for good reason, because there are lots of models out there. All right, so for today, we're going to make one reasonable <coughs> assumption, which is that you can take the highest order derivative in your ODE and write them as a function of all the other guys. Right? So for example, y double prime equals 
e to the y prime plus y minus t would be an example of this, right? Because I don't care what the rest of the ODE looks like as long as I can pull out that highest order derivative. Right? Why do I like that? Well, otherwise it's really difficult not only to solve this thing in time, but simply to just isolate one derivative of your function, right? And, and in particular, you're going to have to do root finding on this function f simultaneously while you're doing time stepping. This is kind of a, a very difficult problem and one that does not appear in practice very often. If you don't like this assumption, we can talk later about, about how you might go about solving it. Anyway, there are all kinds of tricks involving ODEs that, that basically take them from super generic into very specific forms that, that we'll, we'll, we'll be able to deal with. Um, and and, and we're, I'm going to go through a couple of these tricks in detail because they, they're going to simplify our notation later when we talk about different schemes for doing uh, time stepping and so on. Ooh, it looks like I'm going to end very early. Cool. So, uh, right. So, first of all, one thing that's really annoying is that ordinary differential equations oftentimes include functions of a lot of different variables all at the same time. In particular, they, they include all kinds of different derivatives all floating around in different ways. And, in fact, something that's a little bit surprising, if you've never seen it before, is that any ordinary differential equation Right? Anything, at least any separable one, like the, like what I wrote in the last slide, can be written as a first order differential equation. That is, you need no more than one derivative. It's a cute trick. So, so how do I do this? Well, let's say, let's actually, maybe we'll just do it in second order, and then I think you can, you'll believe my, my formula on the board uh, easily enough. So, so again, we're going to say that our unknown here is going to be y of t. Yeah. And let's say that I have. Uh, some formula that looks like y prime prime of t equals f of what, t y t right so this would be sort of a very generic form for an explicit equation well what we're going to do which is actually kind of clever is we're going to we're going to make a couple substitutions Right? In particular, we'll say, uh, let's define, I don't know, z equals y prime, and uh, w, in fact, let's, let's, do, let's add a third derivative just to, to make things a little bit more fun. Cool. And w equals y double prime. Cool? Well, then what do you know? Well, you know, if you read it kind of this way, Right? y prime equals z, right? y prime prime equals w, but y prime prime is nothing more than z single prime. Yeah? So these are all first order relationships. z prime equals w, y prime equals z, and then y triple prime, which is w prime, equals all this stuff. Okay? So let's write this down. So again, you're going to have uh, y prime equals z, z, prime equals w, and uh, w prime equals f of t, and now look at it, because of the substitutions we made, right, this is going to be f of t, y, z, w. So you see what I did there? Now this ordinary, this is just a differential equation in one derivative, right? Now what did I lose? <laughs> <clears throat> well, what I lost was the number of variables, right? So I, I effectively, for each derivative that I added, I had to introduce a new dummy variable that sort of carried around um, a higher derivative of this function that we really care about, y. Right? So like, if I had a 20th order differential equation in one variable, now I'm going to have a first order differential equation in 20 variables. Right? And, and there, are, there are advantages and drawbacks to, to both ways of thinking about this. So for today, we're going to assume that we pursued this kind of a reduction, and we're in this, this first order realm, right? And, and otherwise, um, and, but in next class, we're going to go back and return to this idea and realize that in the end, if I'm trying to solve this differential equation, what is the output that I'm going to give back to my end user? This is kind of a tricky thought, but really the only output that, that we care about is y, right? y of t. The rest of this is just dummy variables that my, 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 my ODE solver introduced, right? So if, for example, z and w are known with less accuracy, 
Does that matter? No, well, as long as I can guarantee that our, our output variable y is known with whatever degree vector. Right? But somehow this, this notation where we've written this thing as just one big first order ODE loses this mindset and it's going to treat everybody democratically. So we'll come back to this later, right? If you, for, in particular, if you want to simulate f equals ma, we're going to use a really cute trick where we'll, we'll, we'll know uh, your position with two degrees of accuracy, your velocity with one degree of accuracy, and your acceleration with zero. And somehow that's all okay because they're multiplied by different powers of delta t, right? Anyway, so let's do a, a, a quick example of this. I think it's pretty easy, right? So, so if we have uh, the third derivative of y looks like this, right? And then what could I do? Well, I could say, okay, so, so in particular we're going to have y, the first derivative of y, and the second derivative of y, right? And then what the first derivative of y we're going to define to be z. Okay. The first derivative of z we're going to define to be w. Right. And the first derivative, uh, or, or the first derivative of w is the same as y triple prime. Right. So in particular, uh, you'll get uh, what, one minus two, three. Yeah. So you see this kind of trick? Cool. Hopefully I did that. Right. Yeah. All right. So our next, from, for my next trick, we're going to get rid of t. So remember, so, 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 so far, what does our ODE look like? Well, as long as y is a vector, we can think of our differential equation as y prime, single prime equals f of t comma y. Because okay, this is a first order ODE, and we showed how to get rid of all the higher order derivatives. But in fact, now, I claim that not only can you get rid of the higher order derivatives? In fact, you can also get rid of the t. Right? And, and how can we do that? Well, we can, we can do kind of a, a, we can make kind of a stupid observation, which is, what is dt dt? It's one, yeah? t changes with one unit in t. I think that's a pretty reasonable statement. Yeah? So I can introduce another variable that's t. Right? And then we know we know a differential equation that t is sat that, that that's satisfied by the by the time variable t. Right? This is going to look a little bit like a tautology, but in fact it actually gets rid of this guy. Right? Because what I could do is say, okay, well well now let's let's say we can we can think of it as y t where this is now an unknown. Right? Well what what is this? Well this is going to be. So now I promoted t to sort of an unknown, but I said this derivative is just one, yeah? And, and, and pretty clearly this system, now you can think of this right-hand side as a function of y and t all as unknowns, rather than t being this, this thing that marches forward in time, okay? So in the end, right, what this tells me is that I can write down any ordinary differential equation, at least any separable one, as y prime equals f of y after changing around the dimensionality of y, moving t into things, and applying all these cute tricks. Hopefully you guys all agree with me. Well, this is great, right? I mean, this is super exciting, because we took what used to be a really complicated problem in a bunch of super high derivatives, and we got rid of all of that, and we made it into like a first order thing, and somehow this thing looks a lot more tractable than what we started with, yeah? And so the, 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 the initial schemes that we'll talk about all deal with solving this equation, but in the back of your head, you should be thinking that, well, in fact, this isn't just solving this one equation, it's solving any, any uh, separable ODP. Yeah. Anything where you can pull out that highest order derivative. Yep, there it is. I guess here, I, by the way, I, I, to, to kind of disambiguate t as a function and t as a variable, you could make a function g bar of t whose first derivative is 1. <laughs> Yeah, and then g bar is nothing more than t. So I mean, this is a noting of the results. These are all just notational tricks. All right, so there are lots of ways to think about uh, ordinary differential equations in your head, and, and if you're ever lost or, or stuck thinking about how to draw these things and figuring out what all your different integration strategies are doing, I would encourage you to draw a picture and think about it a little bit. So anyway, uh, if we restrict ourselves to, to thinking about just this equation, put it back here, 
Okay? And then there are two visualizations that come to mind. The first uh, is a slope field. Right? So what's the idea here? Well, you can think of, let's say that I have the ordinary differential equation y prime equals f of y, and this is just in one variable y, so y is single dimensional. Right? Well, y prime you can think of as, as, a, as, as the slope of your function y. Right? So if this x-axis is t and this y-axis is y, then there's some, you can put these little you know, mini lines that may be parallel you know, have, have the slope of, of, of f of y, right? And then when you, when you solve an ordinary differential equation, right, maybe these guys break down, you're kind of tracing a function from some starting point through the slope field um, and, and integrating it over time. And this gives you a good geometric way to think about what we're going to do when we solve these things with time stepping, right? You're going to follow a slope now for, a, for, for some positive amount of time and then chain together a bunch of line segments. As you can see, you might overshoot. The second visualization, which may, might not be as familiar, is this idea of phase space. This is something that physicists use a lot. So now, we're going to think of y as being an R2. Right? So we no longer can draw time as an axis, but one thing you can do, uh, let's, let's write him, actually, let's think about it as just x, y coordinates, right? We'll say, okay, so what is f of y? Well, at every point on the plane, right, f of y is a vector now that's pointing in the x, y direction of where, where your, your, your particle is going to move next. Right? So you can, you can draw all these little vectors. I'll draw my favorite ODE here. And then when you're, when you're tracing out differential equations over time, basically somebody gives you some x, y starting point, and now you're just tracing out a curve in this plane. Yeah? So you lost in this diagram time. This only tells you the geometry of the curve that you're tracing out, whereas this guy tells you how fast you're moving. But it, it allows you to show some, some less trivial examples. And, and actually some really fun stuff to do is to Google for, for different phase space diagrams that physicists have. For example, there's, a, there's one for the pendulum, right, where you have your sort of initial starting point of your pendulum, and sometimes your pendulum will spin around, and sometimes it'll, it'll just move left and right, depending on your, you, you know, where you started. And so the phase-based diagram has like little circles built into it for the places where you're, you, you know, you're circling around, and then sometimes it has uh, you know, little left and right motions. So anyway, the reason that I mentioned this, I know that this is sort of from the theory of ODE, rather than... Um, you know, the discretization, which is why you're paying the big bucks to take this class. But it is a valuable way to think about what's going on as you integrate these things. For example, how are you tracing line signals and, and what, you know, what are these methods trying to do? And I encourage you to return to these two diagrams when we consider these different algorithms and, and, and try and geometrically work out, like, well, you know, this method is trying to get the slope of this line to match up at this point, for example, would be, would be one strategy. Cool. So the last aspect of theoretical differential equations that we need to touch upon before we uh, dive into the 205 part of this stuff is the idea of existence and uniqueness. Okay? So I wrote down a differential equation, but I didn't tell you we could actually solve it. Um, and in fact, you know, just like we can have some equations that, that, that you can't solve, right? you can also write down some ODEs that simply don't have solutions or have more than one solution, and both of those obviously will create problems for a simulation tool. In particular,